Yes. Especially. Oh, I. Can it? Can everybody hear us? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So um, our our panel is, is called first first encounters with Black Mountain College. Um, an undergraduate class on Black Mountain College, and I'm going to start off, and then and then my students who were in that class. This class uh, took place spring semester of 2018, so essentially from January of 2018, roughly to middle May, um, and we've been together ever since. By the way. Um, I teach a course at Appalachian State University simply called Black Mountain College, a kind of history of the school. Approaching spring semester of 2018, as I was preparing to teach it for the fourth time in the past many years, I was scratching some notes, and on a lone piece of paper I scrawled in big letters, turn the Black Mountain College class over to the students. Then I circled it. In truth, I had no real idea what that meant. <laughs> Actually turning a class over to students, making them responsible for their learning in the spirit of Black Mountain College. What I had in mind was the original intent of the college, stated in its very first catalog, to provide a place where free use might be made of tested, improved methods of education and new methods tried in a purely experimental spirit. I also had in mind an extraordinary document I came across in John Andrew Rice's papers, housed in the W.L. Urey Appalachian Collection in the Belk Library at Appalachian State. A tattered, cracked, single page of aged onion skin with Rice's own penned-in emendations. At its crest, the heading in all caps, the purpose of the college. It begins, the purpose of the college is to lead on to creative consciousness, a carefully selected group of talented young men and young women who are eager to know, to will, and to do. The medium for the development of a broad-minded personality which can function cooperatively are the subjects taught and the activities featured by the college. Toward the bottom of the page is an epigraph from St. Paul, 1 Corinthians, as to knowledge, we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth, puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Across its very bottom edge in Rice's penmanship sprawls inner freedom in judgment and action. The real story of the class will be related in much more poetic detail by Zoe, Dylan, Abby, Grayson, and Tommy, and they'll all introduce themselves when the mic is passed to them. Five of the 11, talented young men and young women eager to know, to will, and to do, who are in the class to which I refer, a class I will never forget because those students taught me so much. Because we have met to rehearse, if you will, this panel, I know they will mention me in their remarks, and I am flattered and touched by their kindness, but they are the real story. Teaching, or maybe I should say facilitating their class, ended up being my greatest adventure in teaching in my nearly 42 years at the head of a classroom. It began for me by getting out of the way, attempting invisibility. And I did this with some hesitancy, some trepidation. What does it mean, really, for a teacher to give up control of his class, to turn it over to the students? I really didn't know. I had tried it before with other Black Mountain classes I had taught but it had never quite happened. Teachers tend to be neurotic about measurement. They are conscious of delivering a product to their students, something quantifiable, making sure that a once empty or half-filled vessel is filled and then measured via learning outcomes, whatever in the world that term means. But truly, how does but truly, how does one measure the growth of the whole person? How does one gauge inner freedom in thought and action? But I also want to talk nuts and bolts here because we had a syllabus, we had texts, and we had assignments, and we met in a very real classroom with those stingy little desks under fluorescent lights, though we met in a number of other kinds of off-campus classrooms as well. Again, the course is simply called Black Mountain College, and its course description is as follows. 
This course will tackle the phenomenon of Black Mountain College, how a band of disgruntled academic dissidents from Rollins College in Florida, <coughs> led by John Andrew Rice, founded Black Mountain <coughs> College in North Carolina's very rural Swannanoa Valley in 1933. Black Mountain College closed its doors in 1957, yet to this day it remains the greatest experimental academic adventure ever launched on American soil. During its shimmering stormy history, many of the world's greatest thinkers and artists were in residence or paid visits at Black Mountain. As Martin Duberman points out in Black Mountain, an exploration and community, it was the forerunner and exemplar of much that is currently considered innovative in art, education, and lifestyle. And of course, uh, Duberman wrote that in 1972, and it's still very much the case, if not more so, all these years later. The course's goals and objectives are examine the literal history of Black Mountain College as well as the climate and condition in the world and in education at the time that spawned it. Examine Black Mountain's obvious importance as a one-of-a-kind phenomenon with far-reaching influence that in many ways defines experimental, experimental and avant-garde and even anomaly Examine the concept, nature of community, and its interdisciplinarity, its wonders and dangers as it pertains to education, in particular to Black Mountain, and the resulting compatibility friction that occurs between the individual and the community. Examine an arts-based curriculum fe featuring the master-apprentice model and what results when students are responsible for their own learning. Examine other trends, movements that were launched out of Black Mountain and its far-reaching influence. Examine what it means to privilege in the spirit of true learning and discovery, spontaneity and improvisation over a predetermined, often traditional course. Examine through close attention the various works deemed experimental avant-garde, what it means to be experimental and avant-garde. Our texts were Black Mountain by Martin Duberman. <coughs> I keep a shelf of now foxed and dog-eared loner copies that I retrieve at the end of the semester and then pass on to my next Black Mountain crew. We also read the Black Mountain book by Fielding Dawson. And then there were a couple dozen or more readings from the public domain along with handouts as well as a handful of films. What's more, this particular class coincided with Appalachian State's Black Mountain College semester, which will be discussed in detail in the panel following this one in room 206. A campus-wide collaboration among multiple departments across the university, as well as collaborations with area museums and other venues to host exhibits, lectures, and workshops, as well as a special Black Mountain College issue of Appalachian State's Appalachian Journal, that highlighted the significance of Black Mountain's influence within the Appalachian region's creative, educational, and political movements. The Black Mountain semester hosted on campus Catherine Zomer, who screened her watershed film Fully Awake, Catherine Chaddock, John Andrew Rice's biographer, the legendary Beat Ann Waldman, David Silver, Julie Thompson, Mary Emma Harris, Alice Sebrell, you know a lot of these names, and Black Mountain alums, Frank Hirsch, Basil, and Martha King. There were dinners with each of these luminaries, and my students were invited to them. Frank Hirsch and his daughter Holly, Basil King and Martha King, and Susan Maldivan, Fielding Dawson's wife, visited one of our classes a rather miraculous 75 minutes. Mary Emma Harris and David Silver visited and mesmerized us. We spent a class in the special collections in ASU's Belk Library that houses John Andrew Rice's papers. We visited Appalachian's Turchin Center for the Visual Arts and their extraordinary exhibition, Creative Democracy, The Legacy of Black Mountain College. In an epic field trip over three days, we visited Blue Ridge Assembly, the original home of BMC, where we quartered the Lake Eden campus, home of Black Mountain from 1941 to 1957. We visited Black Mountain College Museum and Arts Center here in Asheville, and we're were taken expert care of by Alice. We viewed then its exhibition of work by Black Mountain student Gerald Vandeville. We visited the Asheville Art Museum to browse its Black Mountain collection. 
the Western Regional Archives in Oteen, where the amazing Heather treated us to an afternoon that I, I, I think I can say the students will never, ever forget, where all of Black Mountain's records and papers are stored, including Martin Duberman's. We had two classes at my home around a fire pit. Thus, we were immersed in Black Mountain, washed in its blood, who knows, maybe brainwashed, because it seemed to take. They are here with you today, and I would warrant that they are the next generation of Black Mountain scholarship. So, I do want to say this before I turn it over to, I think Zoe's first, yeah. Um, that in, in getting here, and we were hustling to get here. Um, Yikes. Y'all were hustling. But, but, but we're old travelers together. I somehow managed, literally, y'all, to run over in my automobile my computer. Oh. I mean, literally, honest to God, did that. Yeah. And it ended up being fine. So, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, I, and I stayed, I stayed up till, I mean, about 2.30 trying to finish this and something else and thought, oh, the irony, but. Um, if, if it happens again, donate it to the archive. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's not Black Mountain yeah. this, for this morning. That I'm over. <laughs> yes, so it was fine except for the tire mark. Um. And, and so do you need the mic, do you think? I don't think Maybe. I'll be all right. Okay, so we have it if any of y'all, you know, if it turns out folks can't hear it, just yell pass the mic around. Um, hello all, my name is Zoe Chaplin. I'm a business management major at Appalachian State University. Um, and my minors include sustainable business and as of recently, experiential integrative learning. Um, I first met Dr. Joseph Bethanti when he gave a reading to my freshman class at Watauga Residential College. At the time, I had just recently discovered the John Andrew Rice Papers, an intimidating 15 boxes measuring seven and a half linear feet in which I had found my fascination with education of the past, and particularly what happened at and to Black Mountain College. I wanted to start at the beginning, so I started with Rice. I wrote a horrendous 25-page blob of information on rectors of Black Mountain College with a particular focus on Rice, in the foundation of BMC. The majority of my history on Rice came from Catherine Chaddock's Visions and Vanities, John Andrew Rice of Black Mountain College, who through my opportunities with this class, I was lucky enough to meet with personally and share a meal alongside my professor Joseph and his wife, the lovely Joan Bethanti, the best teacher that I never had. <laughs> when I read my research paper now, I realized I had no real focus other than to learn as much as I could in the time possible. I checked out every book that mentioned BMC and Appalachian State's library for over a month. Every month I would return the bulk and check them back out again. Eventually I just accepted the fees and of course shortly after acquired my own personal copy of Martin Duberman's Black Mountain and Exploration and Community. Through this experience, however, I discovered works like The Arts at Black Mountain College by Marianna Harris who later visited our class and gifted us a famously bound blank book to fill our own Black Mountain College experiences on, which we started along with our many other projects as a unit. When Joseph gave that reading in my great hall that day, I knew he had to understand Black Mountain College in a similar way that I did, because the way that he read his work was such passion. I approached him telling him about my own personal explorations, and he didn't dismiss my foolhardy interests or intimidate me the way those boxes did at first. <coughs> Instead, he showed me a path of self-discovery and passion. This marked the first of many encouragements he would offer. Following that encounter, I signed up for the course that we are here to speak about today. The beginning of that class had a certain energy about it, um, not determined necessarily, but hunger. We were hungry for something of substance. Um, I was and am so young and confused and emotional and passionate and I was the baby of the group and they really helped me grow up. <laughs> um, it was enlightening to learn about students who were our age and still so accomplished. It gave me a new perspective on my education and its perceived failure. I had not failed, I simply wasn't in control. 
Though I was initially drawn to BMC, it was not until a screening of Fully Awake, Black Mountain College, accompanied by a talk by Catherine Zomer, that I felt truly connected. The documentary inspired me to write a poem about my own education and how I finally felt that I could be in control. Things were no longer going to happen to me, I was going to make things happen. Without the students of Black Mountain College, however, I cannot say for certain that I would still have found that truth. In an effort to create a sense of community similar to what we found in our readings, particularly Fielding Dawson's The Black Mountain Book, my fellow classmate Sydney Lee Van Ord and I suggested that one of our first assignments be an exploration of one, one another's vulnerabilities and incongruence with our strengths. That same longing <coughs> for truth, raw and beautiful, that we see in Fielding Dawson's work. When I read my poem titled Fully Awake, as a homage to my discovery via Zomer, aloud in class. Um, our little group gathered around a campfire one by one um, in a circle that continued into other classes and began to tell one another exactly how we came to be who we were in that moment. Some of the stories showed the darkness in life we all know so well but rarely talk about. We found out for ourselves how art affects education. We were able to take our experiences, our values, and apply them to our studies, and in my opinion, a very Black Mountain-esque way. Throughout the course, our perceptions of one another, really knowing a fellow classmate in the light that they wish to be seen, how they operate, really created a sense of harmony in our adventurous following. Those from Black Mountain seem to have an endless spout of insight and passion. This thought was only made more concrete as Joseph introduced us to alumni like Frank Hirsch, whose artwork connected with all of us, all ages and backgrounds, and whose love for creation seeped out of him like a beam. On a trip to the Church and Center for the Visual Arts, their exhibition, Creative Democracy, The Legacy of Black Mountain College, we were instructed to write an ecrastic poem in which I gifted it to Frank as thanks for his time spent with us. That is one experience I will be forever grateful for and somewhat starstruck over. I started to find my type of education when assigned to research an individual of Black Mountain College. I chose Vera Baker Williams and was instantly inspired by her testimonies and work. Vera's 1981 arrest during a women's blockade of the Pentagon and a month served in a federal prison camp in her anti-war, anti-nuclear, and environmental causes efforts as a prime example of the agency the many youth of Black Mountain continued long after the school was gone. And also the sense of agency and energy and purpose I had so wished to gain. As a person, I found her to be complex and compelling. Her art and the many famous children's books were bright and colorful and showed real people, real compassion for others depictions of everyday life like waitresses and mothers through the eyes of a child. And of course, I had grown up watching her on Reading Rainbow. <laughs> Discovering that she had completed a children's book while still attending Black Mountain really connected with me as I had written short stories and illustrations throughout my schooling, but I had lost it. She gave me hope for my own creations regardless of quality or scale. She reminded me what fell in love with learning in the first place as I found a clip online of Vera B. Williams discussing her writing process regarding her book and share from my mother, but she diverts the conversation to education and her feelings regarding it. And this is what she says. She says, I don't know about you all, but anyone who encouraged me as a child, I was crazy to do more for them. There's a word I bet the people in this room feel. There's a word they don't talk about when they talk about education, and that's love. That's what makes people want to do things. Better people should do things for love than for marks. But love is what, love and education go together just like that. And I really can't think of a better example of that than this class, even those that could not be on this panel today because Joseph and Joan had opened, opened their house to us. We had told each other our lives stories and we had found interests in Black Mountain that continued long after this class was done. 
this class has continued long after those final grades were given. <laughs> we found our own little group of outcasts and misfits, and it was only more exemplified when we went on our trip to Black Mountain in the spring. We had our own type of rehappening in the basement of Blue Ridge Assembly. A series of poems read, um, all the while music is going on in the corner and maybe some running around, I'm not sure, playing in the woods. Um, I just want to reiterate how much this class has helped me grow. And as much as I have learned from the Bethantes, I have learned just as much from my classmates. And so I will hand it over to them. Hello. Hey guys. Can you hear me fine, yeah? Um, my name is Grayson Fields, a senior at Appalachian State University, a proud advocate for BMC and a witness of its foregoing effects. I began my collegiate career roughly four years ago with the intentions of earning a music degree. I play guitar, I sing, I write, and I compose. Um, all very personal and worthwhile ventures, but before too long I found, with slight disappointment, that music in academia, institutionalized sound, if you will, didn't suit my figure, which necessitated a redirection. Um, not so much a reorientation, but rather a, a slight change of course. I'm now an interdisciplinary studies major with a minor in psychology, though I have continued outside the classroom with my music. Can't escape the music. Um, scholastically, I've been incorporating the study of communications, its mediation and its mass, as well as interpersonal impact, and English, its literary forms and creative apparatuses, both to earn my degree and to further my understanding of how and where and why we communicate. Um, the past few years, the most recent being gasped by what I feel to be the BMC mindset, have been an invigorating process which has sprung both vocationally and personally, new patterns of thought and nuanced conceptions of perception, expression, interaction, and education. I took Professor Bethany's class, Black Mountain College, last spring and have grown exponentially fascinated with both BMC itself, the functional facets of a working institution, and its innards, those who live there. Aside from the attendees' incredibly diverse range of work, encompassing newfound forms of literature, Charles Olson, contentious musical compositions and ideologies, John Cage, variegated abstracts and articulated visual arts, Frank Hirsch, Cy Twombly, Willem de Kooning, ingenious and unprecedented architectural structures and designs exceeding purposes far beyond short-term utility and sheer aestheticism, Buckminster Fuller, and his geodesic dome, sustainable and environmentally conscious farming constructions, Molly Gregory, beautiful, varied, and practical ceramics, Karen Carnes, and many, many others. Um, but I've, I fell in love most assuredly with that intimate, <coughs> once counterculture, now widespread pedagogical and personal mindset, what I think is the BMC philosophy. BMC insisted and subsisted on individuality and strong work ethics. There were no grades, no deadlines, no have-tos, nobody woo me. Yes, the quarters were tight, the funds always scarce, the food insubstantial and periodically non-existent, but ambition, drive, integrity, and individuality overflowed. At BMC, everything was tantamount to an involved, effervescent classroom, a lively afternoon discussion, a nightly self-reflection, a 28-hour work binge fueled by insight, coffee, maybe a 12-pack, and at its best, personal progress. Here, there, at BMC, in here today, 
All were and all was laid out bare, naked, and vulnerable. Everyone was exposed to themselves and those around, which at times made for a cantankerous, contentious, self-centered bunch. But that was the greatest part. BMC was a community, yes. Yes, a community. Centered, self-centered. Um, oh, but a community, but a community, self-centered. And I mean this non pejoratively BMC was a community, self-centered, in one of the most progressive and personal ways possible at the time. At BMC, you couldn't help but grow inward. You couldn't help but show out. You couldn't help but practice, perfect, and perform yourself. BMC allotted the means to practice, invested the time and space to perform, and propagated the self-centered confidence, or invested the time and space to perfect, and propagated the self-centered confidence needed to perform. Attendants were so inside of themselves that they gorged greatness, a personal greatness. We, the present adherents, must dive inside ourselves there is something of value. Despite contingencies, despite anxieties, whether or not elitist, monetary, or otherwise commercial success awaited, ambition, drive, integrity, and individuality persisted. The BMC mindset persisted. And today, I believe it persists. For example, we see this, I see this, in Appalachian State's interdisciplinary program. Here, I've been given the personal freedom to handpick what I think best suits. Instead of abiding by a rigid step-by-step -step program of study, taking specific classes in a specified order, molding myself to fit a generalized frame, I have the freedom to choose both subjects and classes apropos to my interests and abilities. Here, I'm able to hone what I feel is important and purposeful. Here, I'm able to soak myself in myself, with myself, thus inflating myself. Now, feel free to dissent, but what is of utmost importance? Yourself, myself. What can you do well, and what can I do well? That's what I think BMC was about. What can you do well, and how can you improve on that? A community of self-improvers populated Bucolic Black Mountain, which my class and I were able to visit last year. A terse collection of invigorated teachers, students, friends, and colleagues paved way for a continuum of solid work and meaningful lifelong endeavors. Having taken Bethancy's class, having delved into the pedagogical and personal lives of BMC, I've enlisted myself in what I think I'm worth. I've enlisted myself in what I believe I am, and I have enlisted myself in what I know I can be. Reflecting on the hypothetical, what if I've never been exposed to this, this institutional haven, if you will, I'm incredibly grateful, humbled, and driven. Without this class, and without Professor Bethancy's insight and direction, I may never have unpacked my full self my abilities, my possibilities. I'd like to thank you, Professor Bethancy, for your insight and direction. I'd like to thank the audience for your attentiveness and legitimate interest. And lastly, and especially, I'd like to thank this. This, I believe, is BMC prolonged. We are all appendages. Thank you. senior at Appalachian State, majoring in interdisciplinary studies as well, um, combining the sociology of social inequalities with public administration and a minor in communications. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking all of you for having us here to present uh, it's an opportunity unlike any other, and I don't think we could have imagined this, like, what, a year ago when we began <laughs> our Black Mountain <laughs> College class. And I'd like to begin my piece with a quote from Molly Gregory. 
Black Mountain's contribution was that you could live creatively simply by the way you looked at life and the way that you lived it. I didn't learn technique at Black Mountain. I learned a point of view. So how does one learn a new point of view? Well, I discovered Molly Gregory when our class was assigned to present on one of the infamous Black Mountain College members. And as I was rummaging through, uh, the decision was between Molly Gregory and Joan Loveless. And I ended up choosing Molly, because it's the name of my dog, <laughs> uh, who ended up also being an honorary member of our class. And I began uh, drafting for this panel on the fourth anniversary of her adoption, and it had me just reflecting on what a wonderful opportunity it was for her and how it helped her to grow and trust just a little more. Uh, Molly was my finishing chemo present and our union was one of fate. Uh, I'd been suggesting the name Molly to all my friends and family that seemed to get new pets the months prior and no one named them Molly. Uh, and I found myself finally at the local shelter in Irmo, South Carolina, visiting some of the other dogs there and while going out the door with no pup to call my own quite yet, I saw Molly. Uh, she was behind the glass, ears pricked up, looking at me, and I was, I like found the closest employee and I was like, can I meet this dog? Like, this is my dog. And she was like, well, she just came in, so you're gonna have to wait, set up a meeting. And so I set up the meeting, came back later in the week, I told my mom on the way home, I was like, mom, that is like my dog. I know her name is Molly, like everything, like <laughs> that's it. And so we went back, Molly slithers into the <laughs> meeting room very reluctantly. I sat on the floor, I fed her treats. I was just wondering, I was like, how, why does your skin look like scab sunburn? And how could somebody neglect such a sweet dog like you? I, I felt some connection through a little bit of brokenness between the two of us. And she warmed up to me and when the shelter employee came back in, she wouldn't leave my side and I just knew. So the adoption papers were signed, she got spayed and finally came home a few days later. Uh, we slowly began to learn about each other's past I couldn't walk too well. She hated older white men, especially when they were wearing hats. Uh, sometimes I'd cry a lot and she couldn't meet a new person without total fear and skepticism. Molly came a long way in our first few years together, but that Black Mountain class was pivotal for our growth. When I asked Joseph if I could bring my dog to class, <laughs> he was like, uh, try it. <laughs> um, and then I brought her in and he realized she's not like a crazy dog. She's very timid and um, that that class was pivotal for her just with the consistent socialization with people she wasn't completely familiar with and a building that was not her home base. Um, and come to find out Molly was kind of like some of those Black Mountain College members. She was an outcast, a misfit, apprehensive of what was considered normal to most, and the influence of Black Mountain gave her renewed personal growth in her, unlike any other I had seen the three years before having her. Um, she went from being in class, sitting exclusively under my chair, uh, to approaching these men, <laughs> especially him, that she was terrified of. <laughs> um, and what, of course this was like with the help of treats, like this isn't just free will. Um, uh, and finally she got to the point where like she'd go up to them and they were petting her and she was, she was a part of that Black Mountain class. Um, mm -hmm. And <laughs> so in the same way that uh, this affected Molly regarding her trust and growth. There were similar effects uh, on my life. So trust has been an ongoing struggle for me the past decade. I've experienced a wide array of loss and along with it with my trust in a God, friends, family, men, the cells of my own body, the hope in our humanity that what's honest and good will prevail. And as trust and all that seemed to wither, so did 
what trust I had left in myself. Uh, from the get-go, as mentioned earlier, there was a trust given from Bethanti when he told us he was handing the class over to us. There was something for each of us to receive which transcended the importance of a good grade. There was a challenge and comfort in the shared responsibility of the trust among the group. And we began sharing personal statements suggested by Zoe and Sydney. Uh, and this opened us up to each other's worldviews and aspirations. And as the class went on, there was an understood responsibility to bring forth that meaningful contribution to our class's conversation and to remain open to our diversity and points of view. Uh, one particular discussion we had was about intuition, and it really stuck with me. And simply, I understood it as one's natural proclivities and adherence to going with your gut. Embarking on Black Mountain left me wishing for nothing more than an opportunity to participate in that experimental learning. I yearned for this space to just be, create, and love fully without pressures for myself or others for perfection. I realized this was within my control to certain extents, and Black Mountain encouraged me to feed into these creative intuitions in ways I wouldn't have really made the time for previously. Uh, all throughout my life, I found the most joy when I'm creating something, whether that be via song, crafts, relationships, visual arts, or writing. And these outlets are those that make me feel like fully alive and at touch with who I am at my core, rather than mimicking whatever requirements are required of the higher ups, you know? Uh, <laughs> and there was a point in my life I thought the definition of my identity came from what I was doing that moment in time, what job I had, where I was going to school, what my major was, what are you doing after school, what are you doing with the rest of your life? I felt a lot of guilt and an overwhelming sense of feeling stuck in one system to the next that I didn't fit the cookie cutter for. I found interdisciplinary studies as Grayson did and I found this as an opportunity to take the reins of my education and craft something that I hoped would be mutually beneficial to my educational experience and the change I longed to see in our society. I continued to learn about the world that we are so fully entangled with and realized my huge aspirations for this larger whole was far beyond my control and I came back to these feelings of being stuck in doubt. Um, the avant-garde style of education Black Mountain fostered to, pr to produce such accomplished individuals from their outcast background encouraged me to more fully embrace my major and accept myself. There is an affirmation of sorts through the eyes of Black Mountain of the many other lenses beyond the frames of our normal schooling processes and our class seemed to be in agreement over the revived ways we could now approach our education. Uh, over the course of our Black Mountain semester, our group was privileged to welcome guests such as Frank and Holly Hirsch, Mary Emma Harris, uh, Baz and Martha King, David Silver, Susan Maldivan, and the list goes on, so many others. Uh, we heard about their firsthand experiences with the college whether through their research or comprising a piece of its history. And being able to listen to and speak with these folks as we read about their time or appreciated their works really helped bring the spirit of Black Mountain to life among us. It transforms Black Mountain from less of an idealistic paradise to more of a realistic possibility. Uh, our group was beginning to feel much more like what we'd yearned for when discussing the possibilities of Black Mountain in our own lives. Along with our lovely guest speakers, our sense of community was strengthened by our time together outside the classroom. For example, when Mary Emma Harris came to visit, we went to the Bethanti's home, which Joan and Joseph graciously opened to us. She had a lovely spread on the dining room table. Um, and we went back again, just with how much fun we had for our final. Um, like our final project of presenting to one another what we'd taken from the class. As mentioned earlier, uh, we came here, we saw 
the main campus and the Lake Eden campus. We got to stay in Lee Hall. We sat out on the porch just talking, hanging out. The guys out in the yard playing baseball. Like uh, that one night that we all were hanging out in the basement, playing guitar, singing, <laughs> reading. Um, and then in the room of Lee Hall, rehearsing our script together that <laughs> <laughs> turned into more of a private performance where <laughs> all of our words were intertwined by our lovely professor and laughs and good conversation to follow just echoed throughout the room. Um, so to answer my question earlier, how does one learn a new point of view? Uh, it's community, passion, trust in others and our own t intuitions to bring this and to bring purpose. Um, so to Zoe, Grayson, Dylan, Tommy, David, Greg, Jeb, Sydney, Brooke, Molly, Joan, and of course, Joseph, <coughs> I just wanna say thank you for providing this inspiration, perspective, purpose, new will for life and for trusting my intuition and accepting myself. Um, and thank you for shaping that point of view and the renewed sense of self I've gained. before I get started. <laughs> and please think about it while I talk. You don't have to answer it, but just please give it some thought. What do you think I stand for? Just looking at me, who do you think I am? Think about it. I apologize if this comes out disjointed. Um, but back in at the end of last semester, when Joseph asked us, did we want to try and make this into a panel? Did we want to try and present our semester? I realized the rest of my class is so eloquent and so good with their words, and I felt there needed to be a balance to that. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that being said, my name is Dylan Powell. Uh, my bio in the program will tell you I'm from the Jackson County, uh, uh, rural county in Eastern North Carolina, uh, where I grew up in the community of Taylor's Bridge basically just my family and I, very uh, rural part of the state. I'm a senior here, at, or there at Appalachian State, uh, majoring in public administration. I'm duly enrolled in a four plus one program where I've already started a master of public administration. I've also completed a minor in community and regional planning. I've also, I've often considered my major to be a very applied major, uh, where you, you learn something, you do it, and it's, pretty straightforward, um, where I don't get quite as much conceptual freedom as BMC scholarship allows me to get. Uh, this is where I draw so much value from my experience at, in the Black Mountain College semester, uh, that my major and this study are juxtaposed, they're juxtaposed with each other. They seem so different to me and that's why it seems so right in my eyes that I participate in BMC activities. gives me different viewpoints in my daily interactions with others. I also have trouble letting my hair down sometimes, trying to relax. Um, but BMC has taught me to do that relaxing while I'm working, uh, and also to do that relaxing especially while I'm relaxing. <laughs> BMC, Black Mountain College has rel related the experience there went the disjointed part I was telling you about. <laughs> Black Mountain College related experiences have reminded me of the value of slowing down, a value I learned quite a bit about while I was spending quality outdoor time in the Boy Scouts as a youngster. But after a difficult two and a half first years of college, I had lost some of my ability to relax, especially in the semester prior to my Black Mountain College semester, in which I learned the true value of burning the midnight oil and the toll that it takes on someone our age trying to get through, get their education, and look forward to the rest of their lives as well. 
one of the key themes of Black Mountain College uh, that I've drawn, I drew from my semester, uh, was the important mixing of my work and my play, of keeping things interesting. I'm all too familiar with the idea of letting my stress drive me. I often like to tell people that stress is the force which holds my body together. Without it, I wouldn't even know how to do my work. I wouldn't even know how my work would get done. And this style is effective, but it is unsustainable. It isn't fun. And I know that not everything I ever do will be fun. But if it can be, then maybe it should be. Pursuing knowledge and experience doesn't have to be draining all the time. And I enjoyed that side of Black Mountain College I got to experience. When I rolled down the hill outside the barn on the Lake Eden property, <laughs> I stood up and I couldn't even look, I couldn't even see straight. But that was fun. <laughs> when, I, when I got to uh, play around with Molly, as Abby would bring Molly to class on a daily basis, see her grow through the semester, and play with the dog during class. Some interesting stuff when you get to the spirit, some of the spirit of Black Mountain College. Uh, when I sat around the campfire with my classmates and spoke with them while tending to the fire, one of my more personally enlightening tasks. Fire is a very personal force. It can be destructive, it can also be very helpful, and yet we get to tend to it and look at it. We get to ask it questions that we're scared to ask ourselves sometimes. Whether or not we get the answers, maybe that's an answer in and of itself. The fun, deep experiences that came with this class and the importance it played in my education, my education, have been, um, I say that because we talk in our class about education and how you never really get your education. You never really arrive at your education. And so during my goal, during my seeking of education, the ex experiences I got to have in this class uh, were edifying, for sure. And I gotta ask you, have you ever played a game of baseball with your professor and your classmates? I don't think any, none of you have. Well, I'm sorry, but your college experiences was, was unfulfilled. There is a hole deep in your heart that you have not filled yet. And I can tell you, it can be filled whenever you see your professor diving for a grounder. So another thing that uh, Black Mountain encouraged me to do uh, was encouraged me to try to focus more on my writing, on my poetry, try to tap into my creative side. As I said earlier, um, I consider most of my studies to be very um, they're applied, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but I'm also not the, as you might would say, professional art type. I'm not uh, as good at tapping into my creative side as Joseph is, or Tommy is, or some of us as well. Um, but Black Mountain encouraged me to go for it anyways, uh, to relax, to be honest with myself and to deal with the emotions that come up and some of my own personal shortcomings and try to deal with that by putting my words to paper. Um, as for, as for uh, any of you professors out there, any of you who are wondering what it would take to um, run a Black Mountain semester with an undergraduate class. Uh, well, there's, I think there's two basic requirements, uh, and that's love and honesty are the two main requirements. And I'll get into both of those. Uh, from the love aspect, um, we've all done the shout out, and I'm going to echo it. Joseph, uh, this has been a great semester. Joseph was, and I will call him Joseph, I, um, mm -hmm feel as though he's, um, he is my elder, but he is my colleague as well in this class. Um, but it helps to have a caring professor, a professor who really wants to see the student grow and wants to be interested and wants to be involved in what the student is trying to do. And any professor that wasn't Joseph DeFanti would have fallen short of that, I believe. Unless Miss Joan made the <laughs> Black Mountain College is a very personalized topic and the facilitator should be as such. Um, with Joseph, uh, he, was, he was honest with us. We saw his relaxed side in class when he told us the class was ours. We saw his intense side when he really, perhaps something wasn't going his way, but he knew that that didn't mean it was going wrong. 
And rather than try and steer us in a different direction, he stood back and he said, this is where the students are going and this is where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. And that kind, of, um, that kind of experience with our educator, I think, was, is tantamount the right word? Maybe it's not, I don't know. But it's, it's certainly important. The man, to me, reflected what Black Mountain College could be to each of us. And then the second point, honesty, and that's honesty with ourselves, honesty amongst ourselves, uh, that we had to face each other, we had to face our professor, and we couldn't, we couldn't allow ourselves to wear that mask that we wear every day. The mask that I wear when I go to pay my bills or go grocery shopping, or the mask I wear when I go to my other classes or when I'm with other people. Uh, we couldn't do that, and you know, at Black Mountain College, when you, you lived nine months out of the year with your classmates, you didn't put them to the side and go back to your room. It was a full immersion with the people around you, and there was no way to, be, to lie to each other. You could try it, and it may last for a little while, but eventually you were going to break down. And that was part of the Black Mountain experience, I believe, was um, that sense of a, a death of your mask and your rebirth where you got to take that mask off and you were finally honest with others and yourself. And that, uh, that honesty with yourself uh, will make you, I believe it makes you a more legitimate person. It makes you more legitimate to the people that uh, you interact with on a daily basis. Uh, it makes you more self-aware and it makes you a better member, a member of your community, your Black Mountain community and then others as well. I hope you can all really see that as an application, we've really made Black Mountain College our own. Uh, I think I'd be good at Black Mountain College, don't you guys? <laughs> I love it. Maybe, maybe not with the whole low food ration. Maybe not the whole food, low food ration thing. I'm not really good on that. We skipped a meal yesterday. It messed me up. But I could do a good Charles Olson impression, don't you think? Who has stolen my daughter's pork chop? <laughs> Stolen my pork chop at least. You weren't smoking a cigarette. I'm sorry. So, uh, in closing, on that note, um, you need to do that again so I can photograph. <laughs> Would you like for me to? Yeah. Wait, okay, I'm going to. You. Okay. Wait just a second. Okay. Wait. Wait, no, wait, you can walk away. Something's not right here, just a second. Probably me. <laughs> well, it's, okay, just go ahead. I can zoom in later. Who has stolen my daughter's pork chop? <laughs> One thing I've, thought, I've found myself asking about Black Mountain College, uh, do you think that any of these writers, artists, authors, scholars, students, do you think they were ever scared of their own inadequacy, of not being enough? What was their version of inadequacy? Do you think a poet stays up at night because they didn't choose that perfect word to describe the despair in their chest when they stand in front of a storefront and look at the kitchen utensils they thought would one day fill their kitchen? What is the right way to tell yourself that you might be a liar if you smile when you read your own poetry? I don't actually have much confidence in my writing, to tell you the truth. But I was taught that if a writer writes what they believe others want to hear, then they are dead. So I say, when it comes to poetry, here I have no business playing. What I write cannot qualify as that which I call it, but it's fun. So we'll play ball and lackadaisically assign our sport a name. Olsen may run me out, but until then, let's play under the Black Mountains for a bit. That was a misostic, did I get that word right? Misostic poem that I wrote on the word poetry when I realized that my writing, writing never, may never sound good to me, but Dad Gummit, if one has words to write, let him write them. <laughs> my Black Mountain College semester has taught me just that. Write it down, write it out, and be honest with yourself. That's what I took from Black Mountain College, and that's what the people on this panel and the ones not on this panel uh, have helped me learn about my daily life. So, thank you. <laughs> oh, this is getting a little emotional.
emotional. I, know, I was sort of crying. This kind of like, this is feels, it feels like emotion. closure, but it's so not closure <laughs> whatsoever. Ooh, I had so many things I was about to start saying, but I have this blank <laughs> tabula rasa. I think um, if anybody, I don't know if anyone here, well, I know I, <laughs> that was a total lie. I know that at least like six people in this room were at my panel yesterday, but if you weren't there, I did talk a little bit about um, Gertrude Stein and hip hop being connected to the tradition of Black Mountain College. And I was thinking this morning before I started this, you know, I have prepared notes to talk about, but I think many of us know when you get up there, you're like, those are gone, that's, that's not happening anymore. These are hopefully going to happen. But I want to start, um, like him or not, in the past several years, Kanye West has probably been one of the most controversial human beings we've ever known to exist. <laughs> and he releases a new album tonight. But in April, around April or May, he um, was filmed doing a freestyle on slave names and slave tradition. It begins, hopped off La Amistad and made I'm a God you know, playing into that whole story of the Amistad. But as he goes through it, he gets to the end of it and he's talking about parents and how parents strip kids of their confidence and teach white dominance, which becomes common sense. And then he ends his freestyle with the line, see, I've been washed in tradition, now I'm a rinse. And I was thinking about that over and over and over again the past two days, and I was wondering why those, see, I've been washed in tradition and I'm a rinse is in my mind, and I think that's a big part of what Black Mountain College has to do. Whether you go there expecting Black Mountain College to be what you find or not, you come in there and you leave a completely different person. And I personally believe that everybody coming out of it is entirely changed and will go on to change the world in whatever way possible, which is why I love people like MC Richards who have big art careers and are poets, but they end up in these teaching communities and doing things that directly apply to people because a lot of people would attack an institution like Black Mountain College as being impractical or not useful for society when it's absolutely 100% false. Your education dictates how you are going to go about your day-to-day -day life. So I really wanted to start that way and to begin by thanking everyone in this room. I know a few people here like Evie from App State and Caleb from App State. I've seen some of you and I remember Mary Emma coming and David coming to our class and Heather's being so wonderful when we came out to the archives. Just, I have never met an archivist that's just like ready to help as you are. And I do a lot of archival research at Yale and it is not at all easy like it is, like, or nice even. There's people there. So thank you so much. And I think Dr. Ballard is here too. And I really appreciate what you did and the team you had working on the Appalachian Journal. And of course, Joan is here as well. And some of the other people I don't know, thank you for coming and of course all of my classmates I love so deeply and I'm so glad we were here and I'm sad that more of us can't be here and but Fancy will hear about himself so he can wait. <laughs> so I'm gonna do two things. I was I was lucky enough to be born with the last name Young, so I am the last person to present. So my goal today is to demonstrate uh, is to speak on the class that we were in in a kind of loose way and I might break out of that a little bit and get a little tangential because I have been thinking a lot preparing these notes about what what happened to me during the class because a lot of very traumatic life events occurred for me going into it and coming out of it especially with my mental health and I wondered what was going on and if the class the class I was like did the class have anything to do with it I was like of course the class had something to do with it <laughs> like, of course the class helped um, and some people helped Caleb was a big help and a lot of my other friends were huge helps at this point in time um, but so I guess I want to start by ask like I wanted to write a paper that asked the question of what does it mean to have skin, to realize who you are in your body. Before I started the Black Mountain College class, I was riddled with very severe depressive episodes and chronic anxieties. It used to be I couldn't walk across the street or walk into the store without either taking a Klonopin or having somebody go to the store with me or I was one of those midnight shoppers at Walmart with 
basically I would have my hair up in curlers and be walking down the aisle so that I could avoid people. And I am a very social person, but it's so difficult sometimes when you have that anxiety and you want to go out there, but then there's just that hurdle. And I've known Bethanti for several years now um, because I'm an English major and that's where we first met was through poetry. And when I came into the class, our first assignment, the uh, personal exposure, the vulnerabilities that Zoe and Sydney, who couldn't make it today, proposed. Um, I want to, at the end of this, I'm going to read my, a piece from my final project for the class um, that I think sort of demonstrates it. Uh, so I just want to set it up that way, that I will read these brief notes, and then I want to read this poem that I wrote. And I will, I'll say now um, that this poem does not specifically describe rape, but it, it, it's a theoretical examination of the birth of Christ. Um, I was adopted, so it's an allegorical situation, but if any of that, if, if that word uh, triggers you, just know that before the piece is performed. I just wanna make sure everyone is comfortable going into that and no one is made uncomfortable, but that is not yet, so let me just try to focus in on what I had to say. I guess actually I want to also say, when I came into this class, my hair was long. Um, I was probably a little bit unkempt. Um, I was very much more concerned with a lot of other things that I was doing in my life and did not think about my own body or my own self a lot. I was thinking a lot about others and my family. And now as you can see, I mean, I had long hair, it's down to here, and I had it for a long time. And this is radical, and my parents are still very shocked by it. I had no tattoos, and now I have two tattoos as I leave the class. So a lot of, a lot of transition happened as I became more comfortable. Um, so I thought I might share today a few notions of what learning about Black Mountain College meant to me. It is not every day that we are provided opportunities to explore our own educational experiences, our histories within schools. In Joseph Bethanti's experiential Black Mountain College course, me and my peers were on day one exposed to a challenge most classrooms rarely afford. We were asked how we wanted to learn, and the class was essentially handed over to us. We became, as humans are wont to do, synchronously teachers and pilgrims journeying to some form of sacred ground within this county. And we do emphasize place when we think of Black Mountain College because really all of us in the, this room are sitting in some of the oldest geological time known to man. The Appalachian Mountains are so ancient. Um, Having first been introduced to BMC through my piano teacher in high school suggesting I play works, uh, he, he started me with In a Landscape uh, by John Cage. And then I found a lot of inspiration to become a teacher, still again in high school, when I was exposed to some of the pedagogical texts that MC Richards wrote and was uh, informed about how she was teaching in those small communities, especially with students that need a little bit of extra services or special services. I found it amazing how she could take a very experimental artistic institution's principles and bring them out and put them into praxis. And I thought that this is something real. This is very authentic. So I entered college with a love for modern American poetry, and here then I'm finding Olson, Creeley, Duncan, Pound, all these men, but then Richards and Denise Levertov, all of these people circulate around Black Mountain College. And of course, Joel Oppenheimer is one of my favorites. So here I am coming into college and Black Mountain College is on my mind. So that was another thing I was able to talk with Bethanti about before I had even ever heard there was a class three years on the horizon called Black Moon College that I would be in. Um, anyway, so I think it's no coincidence that all of these people ended up here. I really do think it was great that Appalachian State tried to emphasize the Appalachian region as the part of the reasoning behind Black Mountain College because Olson says it himself when he goes, the landscape, the landscape in one of those letters, I can't remember which one it is anymore, uh, the landscape made Black Mountain College what it was. And I know that now and I learned that this semester, especially when we visited the campus as a group and we were able to really 
hear about it. And David Silver, your talk actually did a lot with the barn and just thinking about the agriculture there and how important that was really, really helps with that notion. Um, I, I, let's see, where am I now? I think I'm being a little sentimental. I don't think so. Maybe I am. Who cares? Um, but we all really opened up to each other and we told, her, we told each other about our lives and our struggles and our identities and where we came from. We had people in our class that had had terrible family losses and things like that. We had a, we had a student that had been in the military in our class and think, just thinking about all of these things we went through and how we can all bond over these kind of co collective, our, our, our identities are largely built on traumas and struggles. So and I can honestly say that I have never been closer or more connected with the class than I have been with this group of people. I made friendships that have continued outside of this classroom, defeating a lot of my social anxieties along the way, and I deeply care about the people I shared this course with. Um, over the summer, I started doing yoga again after taking several years off from my practice. Uh, upon returning to my studio and to the mat, I remembered that your practice is your own, at least when you're in the class. But when you finish, you remember to thank everyone for sharing their practice with you because then you realize you're in the communal space and that these energies are being shared. And um, in those sorts of situations, you see practice becoming that big academic word, praxis. And I think that that's a very important word we hold on to, and education becoming a shared experience. And of course, here I am in yoga, and all I can think about now while I'm in a downward dog is Black Mountain College, and I'm very <laughs> taken out of the moment. Um, but so in this shared experience, this is the word experience as feeling is why I would call Bethanti's class experiential. Uh, because here we are exposing ourselves and like stripping ourselves bare in order to communicate who we are and how we feel before we can even begin to learn and realizing that those exposures are part of the learning process, are part of the writing process, that no matter what you're doing is personal narrative. Um, so I have, an, this, is, this is where we get the Bethanti praise. Um, I have admired Joseph's approach to and style of teaching since I first met him three years ago. He is a, he is to me, a, I'm an education major and I am very much interested in trying to explore what he does in my own classrooms because I call it the three C's. He is compassionate, considerate, and caring as an instructor and he truly believes in the work his students do. And I've had, what, four classes now with the <laughs> So I'm letting this become an appreciation, I guess, but I really, I'm going to continue. Only someone like Joseph could have enabled a class like this, uh, enabled us to receive so much from this course. Both inside and outside of the classroom, Joseph is opening his mind, his home, along with Joan, who is so wonderful and so inspirational. And um, Joseph also did drive me to class every day because we, <laughs> we got out of class at the same time in Sanford. And if you go to App State, you know that Sanford Hall and the LLC are nowhere near close enough to make a 15 minute class change you have to drive across campus. So thank you for that. <laughs> Within this course, I think I experienced the independent drive behind Black Mountain College, where students often explored their own studies with minimal interference from teachers. With any of our assignments, especially our final project, a work of creative nonfiction, specifically autobiographical. Um, that for me took the form of an experimental long poem in the tradition of the language poets. It was a bizarre project, but fun for me to write, and through which I learned a lot about the psychological processes behind personal expression in art. What does it mean to have force, to be a force? It wasn't about the poem itself, but how the poem was written. That too reminds me of Black Mountain College. Their process was far more important than what a product was. And as adages crumble away from you, we see that latent antagonist, Josef Albers, instructing his students not to consider their final products art. So is any of what we did art? And I think I would disagree with Albers here and say that maybe since we weren't in his art classroom, I think a lot of the work that all of us in this class did was art. And it was fascinating to have that experience. So those are my notes. Now let me get this. Make sure I have this. All right, so this is a poem. It's from that series. It's called Litanies, and it is about 
conflicts with my parents over my adoption and uh, scenarios of psychological traumas, etc., that happen in a family. So, chant out, feel shame. The destruction of your world occurs within seconds, and the news didn't know to report it. Your brain turns green at their touch. The rock, a sensation of entrance, movement of the wall with the mayfly, revising all your syntactic errors in feeling your Bible falling apart along the seam. Now you regard pages piecing back together and realize a new translation. In the back seat of a car or in the trunk, your parents fuck and she is inseminated and he leaves. He has a wife his age and your mother could be his daughter and she goes home to her dead mother and her father is on another long haul and she falls asleep on the couch of her trailer with your brother on her lap. Did anyone ever explain Jesus' adoption by Joseph, who was not his father? Did Joseph ever have sex? And if not, then why fuck, when clearly the most holy comes from a celibate family? Or did God rape Mary? She was filled with the Holy Spirit, which is God's semen. And he didn't ask her if she was up to the task. He made her, and he forced her to lose his own child when he stole him from her. Joseph is just an accessory. The allegory is this, that in all senses of the term, Jesus was a bastard, and so are you. With the wavering flame held in your hands, the cooling wax seals them together, and now you are forced to speak without motion. You say you are sexual, that you want to be fucked, but that you find your body disgusting. You are depressed, but you think you are to blame, that you are the common denominator. You are the common denominator, that all the people who hate you give the same reason, but you ignore it because the reason is you. You are ashamed, but you'd rather be stupid that you want to lie down in darkness. You are a lie, that you tell lies but tell yourself more often. You are honest, that you turn people away but you can't let things go. You are unstable, that you diagnose yourself but then reject the doctor's worse identifications. You are full of holes, but you only think you plug the ones in your head, that you leave the physical ones longing. You are empty, that you give all you have, but have nothing to give. But that flame goes out. When you look down, the croak of your voice gives enough air to vanish. Or maybe someone opens the door, and everyone leaves you as they can't see you and can't regard you, and their vision creates their hearing. And you realize no one listens anyway to sentimentality because this is expression, which is honesty, is sentimental, is cliche. And the movement you see so clearly, the daunting specter on your mind, is censored because honesty is not desired. Is not desired because it becomes hagiographic. And you are not a saint. You are you, and you is a lie. A lie your mother told you, and the world proved to be true. So thank you. <laughs> no, I, I thank you all. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm I'm embarrassed. Um, but but happy. But happy. Yes, I was going to steal that. But I guess we have. I guess we have. We, we have time for maybe a couple questions. Um, there's questions. only seven minutes or so. So, but if, if you had questions for these folks, I, I know that they'd love to answer them. I have to start with a silly question. Why did you snap your fingers? Oh, that's like, that's, that's it's like what clapping, you do now but not as, as what we're doing. Yeah. I love yeah. applause for poetry, well, personally. The reason, the reason I'm asking is I'm doing an essay now on the, the beat bars in San Francisco in the 1950s. Oh, there was boy. the place um, that was founded proprietor Leo Krikorian and for a brief time New Styles. And the other was one by Peg, Peggy Tolt Watkins, the Tin Angel and the Fallen Angel. But anyway, at the place, it was an old Italian neighborhood, and they had blabbermouth night, one night a week, mm -hmm. and everybody, somebody could, anybody could take the blabber box and just go wherever with it. But they were so noisy, the neighbors complained, and so this is what they did, to, because the person oh. who got the most attention, the most applause, got the bottle of champagne. And Ooh. so instead of everybody shouting, they would snap their fingers. 
That's how it started then. I wondered if well, it was a reference. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're back. Like, that's what I wanted. Yeah, that's yeah. a great like a, story. That's where it started. Like, oh, I don't know if that's where it started. I but bet it did, but though. It, um, I bet it did. Yeah, I just wondered if you had picked up on this. No. How many were in the class? Yeah, there were, ele there were 11 folks in the class, you know, and, of, of it, like a football team, and I was the coach, you know? Um, and they were all remarkable. They just, um, they just couldn't, they couldn't all swing it to be, to be here. So there were, there were 11, it was a perfect number. Joan and I made 13, and Molly the dog made 14, you know? And um, she didn't take up as much space as the rest of us. And, and she came to class every day, and she came to our house, and she, she just, she was the secret ingredient in some ways, if that makes any sense. Um, she was kind of a kind of glue that you could have never expected, a great surprise. Um, so there were a lot. So, so we, you know, we, yeah, Dave. Uh, that was an extraordinary panel. Yes. Yeah. These guys are extraordinary. <laughs> Thank you. Pro tip, usually we often go into panels wanting to see one paper and then you kind of check out. Mm -hmm. It was an extraordinary panel. Thank you so much. No, I'm thank so, you I'm, so much. Thank you, Dave. Um, absolutely. I have a comment and then a question. Um, at one point, uh, Dylan, you turned to Joseph. <laughs> I also love how you started with Professor Papanti, and then you said Professor Joseph, and then you said Joseph, and then at one point you said Joe. <laughs> that, that's a really interesting uh, teaching environment. But Dylan, you said that um, Joseph reflected what BMC could be. And I would like to say that you all reflected. And I, do, and I don't mean you five. I mean you five plus the collective element of this panel, which I think is more important. And, and Tommy, you alluded to this too in your talk, that, it, that to me what Black Mountain College is and what good education is, is when there's a we involved mm -hmm. rather than a collection of me. And all of you said it so much more poetically. So I just wanted to point that out. My question is, um, Zoe, you and Sydney have this personal vulnerability paper or something. Can you tell us what that was? And was it really assigned the first week of class? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> well, they, one, they assigned it. Yeah, so they assigned yeah. it. Yeah, so, I, I wouldn't have dared actually yeah. assign it. No one was excited about it at first. <laughs> um, but I was kind of fed up at that point. And I think my classmates can attest to that, that I was a very frustrated, yeah. angry person when I came into that class. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> thank you, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and I just wanted to tell someone why I was so fed up. And for Black Mountain Work, this was something that I, I mentioned in my speech, I was passionate about and I wanted an outlet for that. I wanted somewhere where I could talk about it and be this dork, right? And just express all my love for poetry and art and how it heals the broken in us. And I had talked to Sydney, um, who I'd only known very briefly uh, through, you know, hallways and stuff like that. And we said, you know, let's get to know these people. Like, let's actually talk and uh, they came in and Sydney and I were like, no, we're not doing it in this classroom, we're not. And we told everyone, we're like, get your stuff. They're like, what are you talking about? And we're like, get your stuff, we're going. Joseph looked at us like we were crazy. I got my stuff, though. He got his stuff, though. <laughs> and it was cold, it was freezing. It was January. Yeah, we gathered around <laughs> a campfire, unlit. <laughs> um, and for some reason, there was an energy of love without even knowing each other. Um, Dylan took off his jacket and gave it to me, even though I was stupid enough to say to go outside. <laughs> and I was very stubborn about it because I didn't know him. Like, I'm not gonna take this off his jacket. <laughs> but he just came around, didn't say anything, just put it on me, and I was warmer <laughs> and very grateful. And then we started talking and we broke. Um, there was so much that you would have never expected people to have gone through and 
and um, I'm very, very lucky to say that although there's five of us on this panel, there are 11. There are 11 of us, and they are all aware where we are. This is being recorded. They will see it. <laughs> um, all the way to Austria, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, that, does that answer your question? Can I follow up on uh, just to praise Abby, not Abby, I'm so sorry, <laughs> Zoe and Sydney for that? Because were it not for that moment, I mean, I uh, don't want to ex expose what other people brought in. I'll mention a few of the objects, but not the people. I read a poem that was autobiographical about me being sexually assaulted. I gave that as my vulnerability. Some people brought paintings in that discussed traumas that they had experienced. Zoe mentioned her, she, she brought in basically an analysis of what had been done against her, like just wrongings. Without that kind of moment, that threshold where we were all four sitting there, Bethanti's goal to hand over the class to us would have never been possible because if you get that kind of vulnerability from a person and have that connection with them, the automatic intimacy and, and a trust. group forms. And trust. You, you, you automatic trust. Yeah, no, and I, I, I do want to say, you know, from a pedagogical standpoint, I would have never assigned them that. Mm -hmm. Because the hierarchy in education, the administration, just the way society is devolving right now, um, kind of insists that that intimacy leads into terrible places. So, the notion of love in the classroom, which we all, if you're a teacher, you understand that. I mean, you love your students, but you can't love them as much as you want to love them, if that makes any sense. So we're, we're, we're actually instructed by our, 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 our betters, our bosses, to not be intimate with our students, because the word, I'm afraid, has this chain of horrifying mm -hmm. associations mm -hmm. That, that, but it precludes real meaningful things happening in the classroom if you don't have that kind of intimacy. So that's why this crew was so great. I mean, I told them basically, you can do anything you want to do if you're passionate and you work like crazy at it. I will say, right on, go to town on that. And they did it, they did it. And you have, but, but it's because they were so great. You, you know, it was a great 11th, you know, it was a great football team. Sometimes you don't have the athletes to do that with. You just don't have the folks. So the, the chemistry was right. That minute, that class. I mean, they said such lovely things about me, but if none of it, and I so appreciate it, but none of it would have happened without, I mean, they're the class. And I mentioned in my sort of stiff, presentation that the real poetry was going to come to, from the right of me today, and it absolutely did. And usually, by the way, the real poetry doesn't come from the right, ever. Um, so. no, I think you're, Joe, I think your problem's going to be with the next class, realizing they're not going to be like this class. It's going to be a different path. Yeah. And not thinking, oh, something's going wrong. I really love those guys, but now these guys. <laughs> I've thought I about think it's that. Be I, hard. Well, yeah, I was asked to teach it again this spring, and I said no. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I need, you know, I need not distance from these guys because yeah. I still have plans for them, but um, I don't want to let them go. And, right. it, and, I, and I never will because you never let go of your students. You've got to finish that book first. <laughs> it's like you have to be sad when you look at this. Oh, the Appalachian semester opportunity won't roll around, or the Black Mountain College semester opportunity yeah. won't roll around here again. So we don't have we don't have the opportunity to bring people here like we do. Yeah. But I do. I've, I've been saying this locally at Appalachian. And I'll say that again here. I'm still kind of hell bent on somehow finding a way for the university to have a Black Mountain Studies curriculum, whatever that looks like a minor, a concentration, because we still have that energy, I think, at the campus. But you know how quickly that, that dissipates, and we also have this big, this big boy, too. And I mean, we have these folks, too. So, um, I know, yeah, Sandy, did you want to say anything? Well, I just sat here listening to you all speak and thought, like an editor, that it would be wonderful to be able to read what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm inviting you Whoa. to send to me a collaboration with Joseph's room 
Marks of the League, the same order, and you have, you know, your other classmates who wrote things that you know this could fit in. I'm inviting you to Oh, thank you, Sandy. As something that would be a wonderful piece to present to the audience of Appalachian Journal, particularly as things relate to place, which is, you know, kind of what that whole journal is about. And so I, I just wanted to say how wonderful and how eloquent and how privileged I feel to be in this audience. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have another project for <laughs> Well, good. That, that gives us another mission, and it also gives me the opportunity to rewrite what I didn't really like at all. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Brilliant, wonderful class. And